Oh, welcome everybody to the second Zoom session for the Greenlander Shawl Cal. I am really excited to be partway through this cal and partway through the knitting of a second set of colors on my shawl. I hope you're all enjoying yourself and uh, that this will be a useful session for you in terms of tips and tricks. So what I wanted to do today was to go over the settlement and the snowflake sections in the shawl, and I'll give you some advice and help with those particular sections. I also want to tell you a little bit more about the story of Greenland and just give you a few little pictures of some of the sheep that have contributed to this lovely yarn and are part of the culture for the whole thing too. So I'm going to do a screen share first here. I'm so proud of myself for actually having this all lined up. And, oh, for heaven's sakes, why does it have to put from beginning? There we go. Yay. All right. It's always interesting to do these on Zoom because, of course, they tend to overlap controls on top of each other. But I thought I'd start off with just a little bit of an additional talk about the yarn that we're using for this shawl and why we actually chose this one. So the shawl, as anybody who's been following along with this and who is already knitting the pattern, was originally designed in our Hairley DK yarn. Hairley DK is a lovely yarn because of the sheep that you see in this picture. So it's a blend of 50% Norwegian wool and 50% cruelty-free merino from Australia. So you get some of the old breed of sheep benefits and some of newer breed sheep benefits. These guys are really quite an amazing group of sheep because, and by the way, I better make sure I'm spotlighted here so that this gets recorded. Yes, there we go. Okay, so these are an amazing group of sheep because they have a really long traceable ancestry going back right into early Viking times. So this is the sort of sheep that would have been brought to Greenland and raised there by the Vikings. And they stayed pretty much the same as they were back in that era all the way through. They're really superbly adapted for all sorts of different types of climates and different types of forage and so on because of course Norway has a lot of mountainous areas it has some flat areas and farming areas but these sheep basically have to survive wherever they are so they are strong they are nimble and as you can see they're really cute and pretty too they have a really good fleece and you notice how it's standing away from their bodies so the fleece has a lot of um, character to it. It has strong crimp and so on. And what it's meant to do for the sheep is to keep wind and rain and weather off of them so that they can deal with really cold winters. Well, the benefits to people when we shear these sheep is that the wool does the same for us. So this wool was bred for thousands of years to be really good for keeping the wind out, to be really good for things like outerwear and strong garments that you need to keep their shape that you need to last a long time and so on. And it's all thanks to these guys in this very challenging climate that they live in. I found the shawl absolutely fascinating because it is an old shape. So as I was saying in the last Zoom, this shape is somewhere between two to 300 years old and it's designed to be very utilitarian. So it's got a nice triangle that goes right down your back and then two really long arms and you can either knot them around your neck there's a lot of different ways to style this shawl you can do it bandana style and so on but one of the ways that it, these shawls are worn is to cross the two wings over your chest and tie them behind your back so the wings on the shawl are long enough for you to be able to do that although i will admit that i did not make them as long as they could have been based on the original recipe because well you'd have to be really 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 kind of bringing the wings back around to the front end, that would really secure them well, but let's face it, not that many of us are going to do that. So it was compromised, but the idea is, is that they cross over your chest and it's like wearing a coat, except it's not bulky and it doesn't obstruct what you're doing with your arms. Now, I wasn't entirely sure that that would actually work the way that it's supposed to until we did the photo shoot for the second set of photos on this collection. And lo and behold, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Even though there's lace in the shawl, I was the coziest person on the photo shoot and I didn't have a coat. But the shawl was crossed over, it was doing what it needed to do, and it was amazing how it kept the wind off of me. So I was really comfortable. So these guys have been very beneficial because of that lovely fleece. 
And I really like this picture because this is another Norwegian sheep and they come with a number of different sorts of looks to them. This one was shorn probably a few weeks before the picture was taken and you can see that this sheep is living on a much nicer area right down by the water and there's this very picturesque recreation of a Viking building as well. So it was a really cute picture in terms of giving you an atmosphere for what we're doing with this shawl, but it also gives you another picture of another variety of the sheep. One of the things that I find fascinating is that the Norwegians do not name these sheep with different breeds. So they're all just white sheep. And this is because they're such an important part of the culture there and they've been with them for so long, they really don't need a, sheep, a name for the breed. They're just basically everywhere, they're important, and this is, you know, just something that you always have. So that's a really neat thing and these guys are super cute. With that being said, let's talk a little bit about some more history here. So we have left off with Eric the Red and his band of intrepid voyagers having reached Greenland. And once they get there, they decide to form two different settlements. So there's an Eastern settlement and a Western settlement. And this continues on for a very long time. However, was there anyone in Greenland prior to that? Well, you betcha. People came to Greenland as best archeologists can tell about 2500 BCE, before Common Era. And these people came actually from North America and they came from the islands above the continent of North America. So they're from Northern Canada and they're Inuit peoples. So they were migrating, they came to Greenland and they established various different waves of settlements. So you have some really interesting names um, given by archeologists. So we have the first group that migrated given the name of Sakik. Then they had a culture that they named Independence II. Clearly these have nothing to do with the names these people would have used themselves. And then the Dorset culture. So the Dorset culture was a group that came and you have early Dorset and then later Dorset, but they actually never left Greenland. So when the Vikings settled there, there were other people. You don't see these people mentioned in the sagas because of course they're very much about Eric's story and these are heroic tales about themselves. There is definitely in the records talk about the people there. And there's also talk about fights with the Spralings and uh, battles and so on. So there was probably some conflict, but the thought is also that there was a fair amount of harmonious cooperation because they certainly would have learned certain trades from the Dorset people there. So like I say, there were several different waves of Inuit peoples that came to Greenland, but there were definitely people there when the Vikings came and it would have been the Dorset culture. So what did the early Norse do when they got there? Well, lots of things actually. The early Norse decided to form a couple of settlements as we, they say, and once they did that, they were choosing land for various different purposes. So the Western settlement was near the fjords there and there was probably a lot of shrubbery and grass and brush. So the idea is, is that the Norse people probably cleared this out and then they were able to do a certain amount of farming and raising of livestock. So they would have cut all the trees, they would have burned the wood and then there wouldn't have been a lot there. So this is pretty much what you see today is you see a lot of areas that don't have a lot of trees and things like that. This potentially could have caused some problems because of course, if you cut all the trees and remove the shrubberies, then you have the issue of soil erosion. And this is a worldwide thing. If people come along and remove the trees, you lose the soil. So this is possible uh, that it was one of the issues that caused the entire settlement in the end to fail. So there's lots of reasons why the Vikings might have left Greenland. And this is one of the possibilities was the fact that they actually cleared the land in order to do this farming and raising of livestock. Because there wasn't a lot of wood there, their houses were actually sunk partly into the ground. So it's quite fascinating how they would build the footings. They will go down into the ground and then they will build up above that in order to make their long hauls and their various different buildings. So the Vikings did in the end settle, se bleh, settle in three separate settlements. So you have the one in southwestern Greenland, then you have a large eastern settlement, and then you have a smaller western settlement. 
You also get some in the middle, but there is of these kind of like moved and fluctuated and so on, so that you had people moving back and forth and joining different communities. Part of that would have been related to the fact that Christianity came to Greenland along with Eric the Red's son, and you would have had churches being built in some two of those communities, and that would have mean that people would want to move to where the churches were so that they could practice their faith. So the estimates in terms of how many people grew up in these settlements in, in the Vikings um, was somewhere between 2000. That's probably a small estimate. So more realistically speaking, between 3,500 to 5,000 Viking people. So a really good growth in population, but overall not the biggest sort of settlement area. There are some people who say there might have been as many as 10,000, but that seems rather unlikely based on archaeological evidence. And archaeologists always do this. You know, you do various different studies and digs and so on, and then you argue with your fellow archaeologists about this sort of thing. But we're going to go with that uh, number that's rather in the middle there. So the Vikings lasted several centuries. They got to Greenland, they started their settlements in 980, 982, and then they actually didn't leave for quite a number of years. The settlements changed, they grew, they shrank, and one of the things that they had to do was to diversify what they were doing. So archaeologists have identified the ruins of approximately 620 farms, 500 in the eastern settlement, 95 in the western settlement, and only 20 in the center. But the other things that they were doing didn't necessarily relate to farming. And this is where they very much would have combined anything and everything that they could do in this particular type of climate and area. There would have been give and take and back and forth with the Inuit peoples there, and they learned to do a lot of hunting and fishing. So they were doing the keeping of cattle and sheep and goats, but they were also hunting caribou and seals. There was a lot of that that went on. The other thing that they started doing was hunting walrus because the ivory was valuable. And so the products, the pelts from the seals and the meat from all of these animals, the pelts from the caribou and so on became trade items. So there was a lot of various different trips to various different parts of Greenland on a seasonal basis to hunt. The other animal that they were known to hunt and trade the hides from were polar bears. So pretty much anything and everything became a currency. It's kind of fascinating because part of what happens with Vikings is that women were doing a lot of weaving and so on. So they would have been trading for wool back and forth between Iceland and Norway. And the fabrics that women were producing were actually one of the currencies that they were using at this time. So currencies were all sorts of different things, not just actual stamped money coins, but they would have been all of these various products that they were getting through these various activities, these subsistence activities. So there was quite a trade with European countries in terms of ivory and hides and things like that. And then in turn, they were buying in things like rope and sheep, wool, cattle hides, apparently. And there are actually accounts of this um, written down as well as, you know, we can find archaeological evidence of it. So while they were settled on Greenland, living there generation after generation, they were very dependent on European trade. And so they definitely had to be producing enough in order to bring these things in that they needed. In terms of boat building, they would have obtained wood from various different places, including probably the New World, because we did have quite a few different voyages taken from Greenland to the New World, and they would have definitely been bringing back anything that they could use from there as well. There was a lot of trade ships between Iceland, Norway, and Greenland, and sometimes those trade ships would overwinter in Greenland. So you got some cultural exchanges. So these Vikings that were isolated from their ancestry still were able to maintain a lot of the values and culture of their original peoples because of this back and forth. Interestingly enough, in the late 13th century, there was a law passed that required all ships going from Greenland to go directly to Norway. So this was partly due to the fact that the climate was changing. We were getting a little ice age forming, it was getting cold, and it was just safer and preferable for this trade to go, preferable to the people who were getting the money out of it, to go directly between Greenland and Norway. So they didn't want to be losing their ships and they wanted to have control over the whole trade situation. So we get a lot of factors starting to pile in on these people around the 14th century, and that's when we start getting population declines. So the Vikings were there from the 10th century to the 14th century, which is a really long period, but 
in the end, things combined to cause issues. So there was a whole bunch of stuff. One of them was, is that the ship runs that were going back and forth that they were very dependent on ended in 1369 when the major ship that had been doing the run sank. Weirdly enough, it was never really replaced. And probably the reason for that was, is that by then the trade that they were getting from Greenland just wasn't enough to make it worth risking a ship. So that was a problem because now you weren't getting the things that you needed, like your rope and certain types of fuel and food and things like that. Your economy would have been really impacted too, because of course they were trading in all sorts of things like that walrus ivory. And if you don't have someone to buy it, that's a problem. So there was a declining demand for their trade goods. Then you got something really nasty happening. In 1402, there were other smaller ships going back and forth still, and the Black Death managed to reach the island. So that killed a lot of people. And the Western settlement, they think, was abandoned somewhere around 1408, and probably the Black Death had a lot to do with that. So now you've got declining trade, you've got the weather closing in on you, and you have disease and things like that. There are also records at this time about various different attacks from various different groups, some of them would have probably been European attacks or Viking attacks, because let's face it, if you can take something from someone else in this era, that's what you did. And there might have been issues with various different groups of Inuit peoples. There's a lot of debate about this, and I could go into it for hours, but we'll leave it at that and that they were being pressured to by attacks and lots of deaths from that. The Eastern settlement, which was the larger one, was probably gone by the mid 15th century. And there were a lot of factors that are assumed to have had something to do with this. And this is really quite interesting because there's no one thing that actually drove the Vikings out of Greenland and no absolute definitive answer in any of the written works either. So cumulative environmental damage is one of the things that's considered to have been a problem. If you farm an area intensively and it's a difficult climate, if you're not regularly fertilizing things, then you end up depleting the soils. They would have also had that issue already mentioned of things like soil erosion, and you would have had the climate getting colder. One of the big things that's considered one of the worst problems that they had to deal with was drought. So even though we think of this as a land of ice and snow, and indeed when they were settled there, about 80% of Greenland was actually covered by glaciers. The issue was is that they weren't getting rain and snowfall where they needed it in their fields. So if you can't get enough water to your crops, they're not going to grow and your animals can die of thirst. So this was a big problem, this gradual climate change and the drying out of Greenland. Conflicts, of course, were part of it, and uh, they had a lot of raids on various different places. And in fact, one of the last written accounts of somebody seeing a Viking on the island was actually finding a dead guy. So somebody had traveled there, decided to land and check out the settlement, and all he found were the remains of the people who had lived there and had been involved in the last battle. Another thing that archaeologists consider to be a factor in the abandonment of the Viking settlements there was the fact that the Vikings weren't really able to adapt. So sometimes a culture can be very rigid. They have a lot of rules, they have ways they wanna do things, and they're not really able because of that to think outside the box. Inuit peoples are very, very good at thinking outside the box, but you think about the various different expeditions to the Arctic and how they all ended up dying and starving and so on while the Inuit people were like, what are they doing? Well, this is because you have a culture that isn't good at adapting to the area that they find themselves in or the, the situation. So this is thought to be one of the issues for the Vikings is that they were having a difficult time because of their strong culture in terms of being adaptable to changing things. So if your walruses are depleted, well, what else are you going to do? Well, this is the whole thing their trade is based on. So if you don't have ivory to trade, now you're stuck. So that's the cultural conservatism. Another thing that probably drove them away and led them to leave was simply the fact that there were better economic opportunities elsewhere. So some people would have left, they would have gone to Iceland, they would have gone to Norway, other people might have gone to the New World, they might have gone to other European countries. No one really knows exactly where they would have gone, but this would be very logical and it would make a lot of sense based on the fact that they would have wanted to go to somewhere where they could do better. No one wants to see their children starving, so why wouldn't you leave? and go somewhere like Iceland or Norway where you would have a better chance. And of course, one of the things that happened with this declining trade is that 
your ivory is worth less. So what do you do? You harvest more animals. And so they ended up depleting that resource as well. So they didn't have as many polar bears or walruses or caribou that they could hunt. And when you put that together with all these factors, there's no surprise in terms of why they would have left. So it was an exciting thing for them. They were really happy to be there. It was an adventure. They were creating a new community. They were going off and they were discovering new lands from there. But over the course of several hundred years, it became very, very difficult for the Vikings as a people to maintain the settlement. And so it was abandoned. The question is, did the Inuit abandon Greenland? No, they did not. So that was a really interesting comparison in terms of how the two peoples were surviving on the same place in the same sort of environmental circumstances, different cultures, different ways of dealing with these things. So with that being said, the next section of the shawl here is based off of the settlement and what happened there. So the First section I want to talk about today is the settlement section in terms of the lace and the pieces that we're going to work on there. The second is the snowflake section. What's represented here is the Vikings coming to Greenland. There's the little house lace that's meant to look like little houses, and it really kind of does. And then, of course, there's the fields off to the side with the grain and so on. And then the open space around the grain in the lace panel is meant to represent those pastures and the loss of crops at the same time. So there's a lot of symbology and meaning in there at the same time as it's just kind of a pretty lace. However, the lace can be a little bit of a challenge to work with. And so what I'm going to do is spotlight my camera and we're going to have a look at this and I'm going to give you some help with this. So the lace section here, let's get a nice close up here, has two different charts to work. And it has a little bit of a setup. And what that setup is, is to get this first little row here. And what this row is doing is just setting up the gold and making sure that you have a nice firm edge to start your lace on. Lace can actually distort the shape of various different garments. So having something that gives it a nice firm beginning is always advisable. Plus for me, that ridge was also representing the way that the houses are sunk into the ground with their footings and their foundations. I really like this lace because it very much makes me think of the shape of a Viking longhouse. And this would have represented a nice big settlement here. So in the pattern, just so that you understand how it works, we have the settlement section. Oops, went one page too far. So we have our settlement section in the pattern and it starts off and says that the tiny houses chart is worked over a stocking stitch background with lace worked on wrong side rows using knit two together and slip one knit one pass stitch over decreases. Why this is mentioned in a note is that this lace in this shawl is done in a little bit of a different way. So just like we had different cultural groups on Greenland, we have two different types of lace. The wheat lace here is worked completely normally with the patterning rows done on the right side. This is how most laces knit. However, the tiny houses, the patterning rows are worked on the wrong side using stitches that would be worked as if they were on the right side. So normally when you're working on a wrong side and you're doing something, with a true lace that would have patterning on both sides, you would be working things like a purl two together instead of a knit two together. This lace uses a knit two together on the wrong side. And the reason for that is that's how we get the texture that sets up the door frames and the edges of the houses. So you're not going to be reading the chart wrong. It genuinely truly does have you using the kind of stitch you would use on a right side row, but you will be using it on a wrong side row. So that's something that's really important to understand. So that adds a te the texture bumps in terms of the shawl. And there's a nice close up here if you need to look at the lace to get a feel for how it's worked. What I've also done in the pattern for you is that because this pattern uses two charts in this area, so we have the chart for the wheat sheaves here, which is on each edge. And then we have the chart for the tiny houses. And you'll notice that they don't have the same number of rows. So this one has 10 rows and this one has 14. To try to work those at the same time is really frustrating because if you set it down, then you forget where you are. So the very last page of the pattern has a row tracker. 
So what you can do is each time that you work a row, you put a check mark in the bottom box or the right side box here, and then it'll tell you what you're working on the next row. So it'll tell you, for example, on row 16 that you're going to work row six of the wheat sheaves chart and you're going to work row two of the tiny houses. So that'll help you keep track of it. I really like these tracker things. They are very, very helpful. And uh, I have included one in here because I personally find it rather frustrating to have to try and work charts of different numbers of stitches at the same time. So this is something that you see European designers doing and I'm like, isn't that fun? I am going to include that. So it's on the very last page of your pattern. And if you want, you can print it out separately. If you're using something like Knit Companion, Knit Companion can put dots or highlighter bars in various places. So you should still be able to use the chart, even if you're working from Knit Companion. So you'll see that in the charts, the keys are different and the symbols are a little bit different and you'll definitely wanna pay attention to that. It's going to feel weird to work two of the charts on the right side and the rest of the charts on the wrong side, but trust me, it's okay, you'll get into it. There's nothing too challenging about it. It's just a strange feel to it. So the first two things that you're going to do in the pattern is that you're going to work the setup rows. So the setup rows, like I said, are just that garter row there. I strongly recommend that when you work the rest of this section that you put stitch markers in to mark off your lace repeats. Again, just because there's this little thing going on in terms of right side and wrong side where you're doing knit two togethers and things like that, if you can tell where you are in those charts, it's so much easier if you're going to look for a mistake or something like that. So definitely put a stitch marker in between each one of these little because each house is one repeat of this chart. And then the pattern itself has you placing markers so that you're going to delineate where the edge of this chart is as well. So it mentions markers. I would like you to use markers because it's actually quite a simple lace, but it's a little bit brain breaking because it's just a little bit out of the ordinary. So there's nothing weird and crazy in the lace. It's as if you just simply turned your project over to the other side. And that really is what we're doing. So the pattern then on the next page, which is page five, just establishes the routine of working the rows and how you're handling the borders. The borders aren't in the charts. And the reason for that is, is that, as you all know, this is already a long pattern. And so if I had done the charts that showed the borders on there as well, you would have had the situation of really big charts and a lot more pages. So all you're going to do is put a stitch marker in, and then you're going to keep on making your increases on each end of the right side rows. And that blank space is going to grow throughout the course of working this section. So you're going to have a stitch marker and you're just going to knit and purl the stitches in between the stitch marker and so on. So this will tell you what to do on each side. So you will do the things until you get to the slip marker. Then you will work with the charts until you get to the last marker. And then you will work to the marker and or slip the last marker and then just go to the end. Now, one trick that I like to do, and let's move this guy out of the way because I have a little swatch that we're gonna do with the lace, is put different color markers on the edges. So what I like to do is I like to keep one that tells me that it's the right side. And so in this case, I have a nice purple bulb pin. And then I always have one that tells me it's the start of the wrong side. And so I put a brass one in there just for fun. All the markers in between these two, I would use a different color in terms of having, if I had enough stitches on here to do the full width of the settlement section, I would have different color markers. This is just a little trick that I use and it really helps me to know where I am because if you are like me and cannot resist putting Netflix and some Scandinavian noir on while you knit a Scandinavian inspired shawl, well, Norwegian inspired shawl, what you're going to end up doing is going, where am I? What am I doing? So having something that's a different color on those two ends is just a little trick that I've taught myself that really makes a difference. You can also put a progress keeper, which is an excuse to buy something cute on the edge. And one of the things I like to do with progress keepers is I put it in when I start that day and then I can see how far I've knit, but they can also help you determine which is the right side and the wrong side. So when you get to the snowflakes, that's going to be helpful because sometimes it's easy to tell what you're doing, but other times, again, you can kind of get lost. 
Now, one of the things that I wanted to mention about the snowflakes is that there you're not skipping large number of stitches like you were earlier with the various different mosaic. It's always only one, except for the very center of the snowflakes. Because it's actually so simple, it's really easy to make a boo-boo in your mosaic. And at this point in time, you have a lot of stitches on the needle. And so tinking back to fix it can be very, very unpleasant. There is a good way to fix it. And believe it or not, in the original shawl, this actually exists. So this snowflake looks just fine. But somebody was watching too much Scandinavian noir and made a boo-boo. And so what I did was to duplicate stitch. And if you look carefully here, you can see the little fuzzy end where I actually took some yarn and just sewed over my boo-boo. So if we flip that over, it occurred in here and I had slipped the wrong stitch and knit the wrong stitch. So I just came back later and duplicate stitched over it. And it's actually impossible even for me to know exactly where that was. So instead of ripping all the way back, leave it and do the duplicate stitch. To be honest, I hadn't even noticed I'd done this until the shawl was completely finished and we were getting it ready to go and do a photo shoot. And I went, oh my goodness, there's a mistake in that snowflake. So duplicate stitch, very easy. And the neat thing about it being garter is you don't even really need to know how to do duplicate stitch. So what you would do is just come up with the opposite color, the one that it was supposed to be, and sew a stitch over it. So that's exactly what I did. And it solved my whole problem. I had to fix the white stitch and the blue stitch. But like I say, I didn't have to rip all the way back down to it. So I highly recommend that as a way to solve things with mosaic. It would not be the first time that I've had that problem. And it will not be the last time because it's really easy when it's a simple mosaic to have those problems. So at this point, we have reached halfway through our Zoom. And I think it would be really fun, Wendy, if we do a draw for a $50 gift certificate. So the way that we're going to do this is Wendy is going to use a random number generator. We're going to draw for somebody's name. And then what you will do is contact Wendy through email and she will set up your certificate for you. Take it away, Wendy. And you're going to have to unmute yourself. <laughs> there we are. Going to have to give me a second because I wasn't quite prepared. One, two, three. Ha ha. Have a good yeah, okay. Uh, you can keep talking, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we ask if hey. anyone has any questions at this point? Because I've talked solidly and not really given them a chance. Oh, Have a quick look yeah. at the chat. Okay. See I did I did manage it. Um the winner is Heather Reif Meyer. Congratulations, Heather. So Wendy, if you, you want to drop your email address into the chat, we'll do. That would be fantastic. It's sales at ancientartsfiber.com. So Heather, just get, send Wendy an email and she'll set things up for you. I'm always super paranoid about these prize giveaways because uh, I know that on social media now, there's so much scam stuff going on that I just want to make sure that nobody ever has to worry about something that would give away personal information. So that's why we'll have you email. I'd love to do more giveaways on social media too, but having had a couple of accounts mimic me and scare the heck out of some of my followers, I really just don't do them at this point in time because I just get worried about the whole situation. Okay. So what I have done is I have set up enough stitches with some markers to give you a little bit of guidance on knitting the lace. Let's just get to our lace chart here. So when you're looking at your chart, you will notice that the first row is simply knit. And this is setting you up to do your stitches on the wrong side. It's very, very simple. There's a couple of things that I'll be wanting to mention about this when we get to that side. Remember on your edge stitches that you are doing, whoops, no slack here for myself, that you are doing your knit back and front. If you have made a boo-boo and you have been doing knit front and back, all along. That's okay. What the knit back and front does, just to remind anybody who hasn't seen the first one or mention it to them, is that it just makes the edge of the shawl curve a little bit differently and you don't see the purl bump in the same place from a knit front back. So a knit 
back front is a little bit different and it gives you just a nice squishy firmer edge. So I thought it was a really interesting thing. I had to do a lot of swatching when I was doing my initial shawl and was quite fascinated as to how that worked. So when we do the knit back front, we go into the back of the stitch first, and then we go into the front of the stitch to make our knit back front. So very similar to a knit front back, it's just done in the reverse order. Now that we're on our wrong side row, we're going to work our first motif. And this is where your stitch markers become super handy because what we can do is just get ourselves there without having to worry about what's on our edges. All right, so the first row of lace begins on this side of the chart because we are working a wrong side row. And we are going to be doing a knit two together and a knit one slip one pass stitch over. So that's a version of an SSK. And each one of these different versions of an SSK will give you a slightly different effect. So it twists the stitches in a particular way. Lots of us will substitute one that we like better, but I would suggest in this case to keep the way it's written. And the reason for that is that this will produce a particular effect on the other side of the work, which helps to build the bricks and the walls of your longhouse. So with the yarn overs, you also are going to want to do something to make sure that the yarn overs are the same length. Yarn overs can be done by wrapping the yarn around the needle like that or by simply coming over the needle. And what you want to do is to make sure that you choose one particular way and make sure that the yarn overs are done the same throughout the entire remainder of this section. I tend to prefer to take a longer path whenever I can with the yarn over. And so that's what I'm going to do here to do this first stitch. So I do my yarn over and then the symbol is knit two together. The reason I like the longer yarn overs, by the way, is that a three ply rounder yarn like this will tend to not show yarn overs as well as a two ply yarn that's meant for more for lace. So this will give me a bigger hole later on. And I like that. I like the effect of it. The next stitch is a slip one, knit one, pass stitch over. When you're not told how to do the slip one, there's a couple of things you can do. And one is to go back to the start of a pattern and see if there's something here that tells you how to slip that stitch. Um, let's just have a quick look and see if we included it in here. Oh my goodness, this is totally mortifying. We didn't. All right, that's actually kind of handy because it gives me a way to tell you what to do with this. When you're not told, what you're going to do is slip it purlwise. So in this case, I'm going to slip my stitch purlwise. I'm going to knit my stitch and then I'm going to pass this stitch over. So if there's nothing in the instructions for a pattern on slipping a stitch, the convention is to do it such that you have slipped it purlwise. So we've done the second stitch in there. Now we're going to do our yarn over, then we're going to knit one, then we're going to do a yarn over again, and the same thing, we're just knitting two together, and then we're doing that slip one, knit one, and pass that stitch over. So that's going to give you texture on the other side and that's why it's worked on the wrong side rows. We could get all cutesy and fancy about how we do things, but that just sounds like a lot of work for not a lot of reward. So you can already see that we have some yarn holes and we have some nice juicy bumps from our stitches on the right side. Remember, knit back and front. One of the things, by the way, that I do, and this is another little tip that I should mention, is that I didn't even say it, but I do it. I keep my edge stitch a little bit loose. See how loose it is on the needle here? Let's try and get this turned in various directions so you can see it. And when I do my knit back and front, I leave a little bit of slack in there. So that's a little bit bigger as well. Let's turn this so you can see. And then I knit my front. And the reason I do that is because then your edge isn't super tight. So later on, when you go and you tug on that edge, this loop, the slip stitch on the edge, will take the slack that's in the knit fat back front and give you a nicer, looser edge so that it can stretch a little bit better. Ah. So just going to do my knitting along this row. Very exciting to watch somebody knit and not do much else, isn't it? 
And it's funny when you know that someone's watching, it really becomes challenging to knit. Now, I almost made a mistake on my knit back front, but same thing on this edge. When I make my knit front back, you see how I am pulling this so that I've got a fair amount of slack? And then I'm putting my needle in, and you see this stitch is actually loose on the needle. Then I do my knit the front, and then I'll knit my last stitch. And again, when you give a tug on the edge, that firms up. And you see how I've got a nice slip stitch edge that, that allows the row to be the height that it wants to be. So I don't have an edge that's pulling in. It's just a little thing that I've done forever. And it definitely helps the edge of the shawl. So glad to pass that little trick along. Hey, okay. now in the second row, we're going to do exactly what we did in the first one. Knit two together. We. Very exciting. And then we're going to do our slip one, knit one, pass stitch over. Then we have to remember the yarn over. Now, what happens if we don't do the yarn over? So I'm going to skip the yarn over and I'm gonna show you a little trick that means you don't have to tink all the way back. So we're just gonna skip that yarn over. We're gonna remember that we have a boo-boo in there and I'm going to show you what I would do to fix it. Slip one. Knit one, pass stitch over, yarn over, and then cut that out, you. One of the things, by the way, that I do on the offside rows is that I tend to count my stitches as I go, because if I've missed or the, the yarn over has jumped to another square, then I will know right away. So I'm kind of along here. Do my knit front back. And the way that I'm getting my slack, by the way, is just pull that needle back and push the needle all the way through so that the stitch is formed on the full size part of the needle. And then that will give you that slack that makes for just a little ease in your edge. We're coming along. We have one, two, three, four, five. Oh my goodness, I forgot my yarn over. So the way that I would fix this relies on the fact that knitting has a little bit of ease in it. So I'm going to find the strand that goes to the next stitch here, which is this one that's sitting here. And I'm actually going to pick it up and pop it on my needle. And now I have a yarn over that might be slightly tighter than the rest, but I don't have to rip my entire row back. So that is a sneaky little trick if you don't have a yarn over. If your yarn over pops off the needle and does something rude, Actually, I think I just popped a stitch off my needle there. So let's put that back on. If you have a yarn over that pops off your needle and disappears, always just find the working yarn that attaches to the next stitch, and then you'll have your yarn over and you can put it back. Front back. Give it a little yank to get some slack in there. The other thing I tend to do is pull that edge stitch a little bit when I get to the end of the row. And that just, again, helps to take that slack out of those stitches in there and give you that nice, smooth edge. So are there any questions about that? Do we have anything in the chat, Wendy? Yeah, I'm just gonna check the chat. No, it looks like we're good. So like I say, it's not a difficult lace. When you look, the next row is just exactly the same as the first two. And then these are just knit two together and slip one, knit one, pass stitch over. Once you get to this symbol here, which is kind of crazy, it's just a slip one knit wise, knit two together and pass the first stitch over. So again, really, really simple. It's like absolutely basic lace. So that's one of the nice things about it. The only reason that sometimes one might get a little bit kerfuffled or confused. And by the way, I made a mistake in what I was showing you. I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. The only one might one only reason one might get confused is that it's a wrong side row. So now the mistake that I made was I knit that stitch in the middle. I didn't purl that stitch. So I have a boo-boo. And when we look on the right side of the lace, what we have is a row of bumps where we shouldn't have a row of bumps. You can either tink back or again, you can fix this. So let's show you how I fix this. Coming along. 
can get this underneath the camera. My camera's set a little bit differently today, and I keep forgetting that it's like that. Slack. Okay, so I'm on my third row. Here I would yarn over, knit two together. No yarn over. Stop being silly hands. Knit one, slip one, pass stitch over. Do my yarn over. Now this is where I have my boo-boo. What are you doing? All right. I did something weird on the last row. Let's not worry about this stitch here. This is where my column is and I picked something up strangely. Anyway, you can actually drop down and pick those stitches up if you want to fix them. So I could just drop the whole row. It's completely up to you on whether you want to drop the whole row. I will say in this particular lace pattern, it could be a little bit challenging in the center and there is a way to help yourself. So the reason it's challenging is because you have a yarn over on each side. So what I would do is take a bulb pin and I would catch each strand as I drop down and then you can use a crochet hook to pick back up. And I just realized that I promised to show this to you, but unfortunately, because some of us are silly, I did not grab my crochet hook or my bulb pins, but you can drop down and then you can pick the stitch up in the other direction. And this really doesn't wanna drop very easily. So now I've got the stitch that I dropped has popped through and there is the previous row. So what I just do if I don't have my, come back here you. There, so now you see I've turned the stitch on the needle. So this is a way that you can solve the issue. You can turn the stitches, but because this has yarn overs on the previous side and I just realized I did something silly there. Come on, I picked up the wrong strand. I don't know that anybody saw that because of the color of the yarn, but anyway, you fix this stitch, it's now turned the other direction and you can do that all the way along. But like I say, doing something to hold the other stitches is a good idea just so that you don't have exactly what I just did there. Now, when you come along later and block this out, it's actually going to go nice and smooth again. It's not right now because I just fixed it, but you can do the little bit of cheating there and that will, oh, see, I just did it again. <laughs> so when you're doing this lace, it's very important to remember that on your working row, these stitches on the wrong side are purl stitches. So we have to purl the correct ones. Okay, so a little bit of muddling up on that. Now, yarn overs. We got a great question in there. I'm just going to, I'm going to take this other swatch I have here. Oops. I'm really good at putting things down right beside me and losing them. This is a nice color because it's going to be a little bit easier to see. So let me just untangle this little swatch. One of the things that can happen with yarn overs is that if you have a knit or a purl after them, they can change in terms of how much yarn that you need or how much yarn that would be done if you're doing the same direction over the needle. So I am just going to get to a clear section here. And knit and purl some, and then I'm gonna show you what I mean. Sorry, I should have had a swatch set up for that, but it didn't occur to me this time. All right, we're just gonna leave the other half of this swatch. So we're coming along here and I'm going to put a yarn over in between each one of these. So, whoops, let's purl this stitch. I come to a knit stitch and I would technically take my yarn to the back to make my knit stitch. What I can do is either bring the yarn over the top of the needle and make my knit stitch, and then you see how I have a very short yarn over, or I can bring it around to the back and wrap it around, and that makes a longer knit stitch, or a longer yarn over before my knit stitch. Now when I come to my purl stitch, I have exactly the same situation of I need to get the yarn around the needle to make a yarn over. With this one, the only way to do it is to wrap it the long way around. You could kind of sort of come over the needle, but then you get a yarn over that almost doesn't exist. It's kind of a mess. One way or the other, whether you want the little short yarn overs or you want the, yarn, the long yarn overs, you have to plan what size of yarn over that you want and make sure to do them such that they match. Because if you don't, then you get lopsided holes. 
So if I was going to do the short version here, I would just bring the yarn over the needle and knit my stitch. And then I'm going to purl. I would not do anything to the yarn around the needle. And you see how I have two short yarn overs that match each other. Let's see if we can get this a little closer. I'm going to continue to show this again. Now for the next one, what I'm going to do is make a larger set of yarn overs. So we're going to do wrapping all the way around the needle, make the knit stitch. I have to do the purl stitch, so I'm going to wrap all the way around the needle. So those two match, and that gives me lace holes that will be the same size. I'm going to do short ones again, because then what we're going to do is knit another row and compare the size of them. So these ones did not travel all the way around the needle. They are shorter than the ones that did. So I'll have two sets of longer and shorter. So I've wrapped the yarn fully around the needle, or I just bring it over the needle in order to work those. Now let's just knit back on the other side and then have a look at them. And what I think I'm going to do, by the way, when you do that sometimes, this is a fun thing. And it's another good little tip. When you do this longer route, sometimes you see how this is actually backwards on the needle. So the stitch is mounted with the front leg at the back instead of the, the front, which is not what you're normally expecting. So you can do two things. One is you can just knit into the back leg, which is actually the front of the yarn over, or you can turn the yarn over on your needle. So that is one weirdness that happens with these when you're going and doing the longer yarn over while changing from a knit to a purl or a purl to a knit. Now in this one here, it's really short. And again, it's mounted somewhat awkwardly on the needle. You can either just knit it like that, or you can bring it over the needle so that it's easier to get to. So you'll find that sometimes your yarn overs might be angled on the needle a little bit weirdly, but don't let that get to you. Just see, here's another one that's turned. Either turn them on your needle so that you feel more comfortable with them or just knit into the back of the leg. So if you have another one here that's twi twisted, I'm just gonna knit into the back of it. And then that works the stitch properly. If this is confusing, I would be quite willing to make another video just about this because it's really kind of cool and it does make a big difference when you're knitting lace in terms of how the lace looks. So sometimes you might have, for some reason, a need to make the yarn over smaller so that you don't have something too big. That usually happens when you're using big needles and a skinny yarn. You don't want those holes to be enormous. But if you want the holes to be bigger, like I do with a nice elastic bouncy yarn like this one, still some more yarn overs, then making them longer is a nice thing to do. Okay, so. Let's have a look at our holes. And you see how this almost looks like a ripple? These holes here, and let me put this down against the white background. See if that gives you a good view. So some of the holes like this one, they're much smaller and then you have much larger. And I'll lift this up, but here we have the two that were shorter and then we have two that are longer. And you can barely see this one. And then the next two are shorter Let's pull this a little further on my needle and the other two would be larger. So there is a difference in terms of the size. Let's get this up from behind. So the first two are smaller, the next two are larger. You see that? So the direction that you take the yarn around the needle in a yarn over will make the holes either larger or smaller. So these two larger, these two smaller matching them when you go across a row of knitting is a really good idea because then it's consistent. So in the lace on the shawl, what I have done is matched the holes so that they're all the same size as they delineate my front door here and my roof. So I hope that answered the question. A video would be helpful. All right, well, I would be happy to film one of those separately. And what I'll do is I'll get bigger yarn and needles so that I am set up for it to be a little bit more uh, easy to follow on there because it's a really neat thing. And I just don't see a lot about that in a lot of books or patterns. And it definitely goes down to yarn structure for sure on a big fluffy yarn. I do like to do the longer path around the needle to get my yarn over done. And again, I will just take this needle, this is black. You can do your yarn over all the way around the needle. 
or you can do it just crossing the top of the needle. So if it's completely wrapped, it's going to make a longer distance. This is not a great example, but it's just the idea of does it take the short way or the long way. And with a round yarn that's very elastic, taking the long way every time will give you better looking lace. So I did want to mention it in this Zoom to try and take that longer path around the needle because then you get a better looking set of houses. It's not going to affect your shawl if you prefer to do the shorter yarn overs. It's not a problem at all. It's just that I like my lace to be really distinctive. The other thing is, is that this lace sets you up for more normal holes, but there is a place in this lace where you could potentially have small holes. And do you see how it gets a little bit smaller on the tip there? It does that on both sides. And if I had not matched the yarn overs, then it would be really, really strange looking in terms of how the yarn overs on the wheat lace would look. So like I say, matching the way that you're moving the yarn over your needle when you're doing lace is a great way to make sure that everything is consistent. So what I've done is I've done my yarn overs the same in the little houses as I have in the wheat fields part of this shawl. So I hope those are helpful tips. The next section with the snowflakes should be a breeze for all of you now that you've been doing some of the fancy type of mosaic. This is the easiest style of mosaic there is. Again, I would definitely put a stitch marker in between your snowflakes. And if you're finding that you're having trouble keeping track of the chart because it is a little bit longer, you can put one in in the center of the chart as well, just so that you know where that line is. Because that, my friends, is where I had my blue. I lost my center line when I was getting to a very exciting part of, I believe I was watching Trapped at the time. Very excellent show that, but has subtitles. And they were about to discover who the evil doer is and boo-boo in the snowflake. So... We do have multiple parts of the chart and you could put a stitch marker on each one of those um, with a different color between the ends. And then, like I say, you can put one there and you could also put one on this center 18, number 18 stitch. So do we have any other questions? And I like what Fran said, mine looks a bit more rustic because I used different for knit and purl. And you know what, Fran, that is a good choice in terms of like, this was a settlement that was doomed to fail. So it doesn't matter in one way if you don't do it at all, it is a matter of taste. So you now have the knowledge that you can make your decisions, but I know my mother never worried about yarn overs and she knit for something like 80 years ridiculous number of years to knit if you ask me but you know my mother was very dedicated and she never worried about the direction of her yarn overs at all there's another sneaky little thing that I'll just mention too is that if you get a yarn over that's a bit small and I'm looking at this and going ah oh, that one's a little bit smaller you can actually kind of give it a little bit of a pull with stick your finger through it and you see how that one is now exactly the same size as the others so you can always make your yarn slide a little bit to change the size of a yarn over. I'm like, oh, that one's not showing very well. Okay, well, let's just move that stitch out a little bit. And then that yarn over is a bit bigger anyway. Yarn slides in the stitches. And this is not a gauge that is really tight like it would be in a sweater. So you can absolutely do some things with that to move the yarn around and make your lace look the way you want it to. So now we're at the end of the time, and I just thought I would ask Wendy if she has any insights to share as she knits her Greenlander shawl. It's a little different for somebody knitting a pattern they've never knit before, as opposed to one who has. So Wendy, any thoughts? Uh, yes, I am not a lace knitter. So I watch TV for the first section and had to rip back. I use lots of stitch markers. I also put a stitch marker in the wheat sheaves right in the middle of the two stitches and every section I counted to 10 and when I got to the wheat sheaves I counted to 14 slip a marker 14 stitches slip a marker I'm good it's not hard it just required me to concentrate no watching handsome guys on Star Wars uh, so that's that's my tip and just go slow and steady and use the row tracker it was a lifesaver and remember that pearl stitch 
There was something that was weird in my row, and I will confess freely to all of you that um, the second time that I went along the row of the chart, I wasn't looking at the chart, and I actually did not have the stitches lined up properly. I missed one. So I put a knit one where it didn't belong, and I went off track. So it's really easy to do even when it's simple, and that's why the counting thing really helps. So I am a lace knitter, and I'm kind of finding it funny that I made that boo-boo today, but you know, one of the ways that I could have fixed that too without tinking back would be to just simply drop the entire row if I wanted to. <sighs> it's much easier to fix 10 stitches and that's why I agree with Wendy about having those markers and just when you're not working the patterning row, just count each section. My yeah. biggest thing that I'll do is miss a yarn over. And or my yarn over slides and I lose track of it. Mm -hmm. it yeah, it can wiggle thing. its way around with colored markers. There's the beginning of my wheat sheaf. There's the middle, there's the end. And now there's my markers for my little houses. And if anybody doesn't remember where the road tracking thing is, it is the last page of the pattern. Cause I know that there were some, um, arguments in terms of the pattern layout because I really really wanted it in a place where it was easy to find and we just could not fit it in the main part of the pattern so then we decided if we put it on the last page then it's easy to find and if you didn't print out all the writing for the charts then you only need to print that one page instead of all of that text so that uh, hopefully makes it easy for you guys to find okay. so does anyone have anything they wanted to add I'm always happy to hear from people. Are you enjoying your shawl? We have some show and tell. Excellent. Okay, I'll start. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it because of the way the sun's coming in the window. Oh, wow. Yeah, I see Wendy's and I also see Franz. I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to spotlight Franz Please. so that we can all see it. Look how gorgeous oh, that is. Wonderful. Absolutely beautiful. Your attention is lovely. Okay, and now I'm going to spotlight you, Wendy, so that we can all see yours. And I'll bring it back up. That is so gorgeous. It's the blues and purples are the colors I used. And we and created that kit because Wendy loves blue and purple. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> I would also say that the lace, when when you're knitting it, it all crumples up. It's going to be beautiful when it's blocked, but don't panic if it sort of looks like mush while you're working your way through it. Yeah, that's pretty typical. Oh, Kathy. Wow. Okay. I'm going to spotlight Kathy. Ooh. Gorgeous. So Kathy's already past the settlement and everybody's dispersing and, you know, now they're sailing in uncharted waters in some cases and all of that. That is beautiful. Lovely. Mm hmm. Okay. Is there anyone else who wants to show their shawl off? All right, well, if, uh, oh, we got one more, Emma. Wow. Look at that. Oh. Absolutely gorgeous. You guys are making really great progress. I would say that this one is a finished shawl. I think Lovely. It is. Well, congratulations Emma, what colors on did you it. use? I can't remember. I this option six, I think. But uh, I also know that I made a boo-boo here because I see in Kathy's shawl there's a strip of blue and i know in the sample there's one too so and i don't know what i did here but it's beautiful it is beautiful <laughs> if, if it's any consolation i think that the mistake that you would have made which is very minor and does not change the shawl at all would have been the mistake that actually the tech editor made the first time that they did the run through the pattern they thought there were no stitches there and i'm like no sorry there's six stitches there and that broke my poor tech editor's brain so you're in good company because she's been tech editing for 30 years. But like I say, it's it's not a big mistake. And the nice thing is, is if you did forget that, the way the math works, it makes no difference. <laughs> well, wonderful. Thank you guys for showing off your shawls. That's really exciting to see them all. 
So I think if we don't have anyone else who's going to do show and tell, this will be the right time for us to say thank you so much for joining us. Oh, Wendy's waving her hands. We should remind everybody that the final Zoom is on April Fool's Day. Not that we're fools. We just picked that date because we thought it would be fun. April Fool's Day is Excellent. Good thought. And we'll be doing some fun stuff. Um, the shawl uses short rows in shaping the wings. And uh, I have some fun stuff planned to talk about short rows and what they are and things like that, because it was interesting to create this shawl. I learned a lot about how short rows work. And so I want to pass some of that discovery along. So I look forward to seeing everybody on April 1st. And like I say, thank you so much for joining us. It was wonderful to see your shawls and have a nice little spot of time to talk about knitting. So we'll see you on April 1st and happy stitching to everybody in the meantime. Bye-bye. <laughs>